Welcome, everybody. This is my friend, Jim Cox. He is the editor-in-chief at Midwest Book Review, and we have had so much fun putting together some helpful tips for authors that want to expose more readers to their work. And today, Jim and I are going to go off the reservation a little bit, and we're going to speculate about the impact of artificial intelligence on reading. Now, I have a little granddaughter who's two and a half, who is already starting to love books, and I'm delighted with that. But I started thinking, when my granddaughter is 50 years old, will she even need to read? And I started thinking, okay, well, we've got closed caption capacity on YouTube. You don't have to read. You just can watch the little ticker tape go by. We have cell phones that we can dictate a message and the cell phone will generate a text message. We have Pandora, we have um, Alexa, where they will serenade us on command. So I'm wondering, you know, back in the day, hieroglyphs were only for the elite. Yep. And now hieroglyphs are kind of, Passe. We have um, emojis. I don't have to say I'm sad. You don't have to read that I'm sad. You've got like the little Pac-Man that says oh, I'm sad. So you've got 50 years in the publishing industry and there have been a lot of changes, right? We went from keyboard to now computer screens and now we've got um, audio dictation. We have audio books. What do you think, Jim, if you're just looking in your crystal ball, do you think that people are even going to need to read 50 years from now? What we're basically asking or talking about is technology's impact on written communication, a book, writing, written, and we read it, communication. Well, technology's impact on written communication began about three and a half to 4,000 years ago with the invention of a pointed stick and a lump of clay. <laughs> I didn't see you coming with that one. <laughs> then we skip ahead about a, you know, about a thousand years. And then we get to, to the technology of papyrus making sheets of, well, paper out of skin and then drawing on it with pigments of, ver of various kinds that technology helped to create. Then we jump ahead still further and we get to the creation of actual paper made out of rags and wood chips and pulp and so forth. The Chinese have the idea originally. And we got paint, the, the Chinese slash Japanese style of paintbrush to go on that paper. Then a guy named Marco Polo came around and stole the idea and shuffled it back <laughs> to Europe. And then we jump ahead a, a few more hundred years and we have this guy named Gutenberg. And he has the gall to invent printable type and mechanical printing press. Up to that time, literacy was the province of the elite. Mm -hmm. Scribes, people whose kings and sponsors had enough money <laughs> to hire somebody to read and write for them. And then we skip ahead still further and we've got digital printing. Now we don't have to have actual movable type made out of lead or wood blocks or, or anything else. Not now we're punching into our computer, most of us not knowing anything about the magic that makes it happen. And we've got words, letters, sentences, paragraphs, novels, history books. What used to be on paper is now on the screen. 
And we lived with that quite comfortably for about, oh, 30 years now. But now comes something called artificial intelligence. Oh, my goodness. I have seen so many science fiction movies where artificial intelligence tried to take over not just the publishing industry, but everything. Fortunately, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. But already, as you and I are sitting here talking over this magic machine, artificial intelligence is already beginning to crop up in the publishing industry. For example, Amazon, the 800 pound online gorilla of book marketing, had to take down 11 different artificial intelligence created book titles, ripping off genuine books oh. because somebody had messed with the system using AI to get false titles and pretty picture images cited on Amazon website, side by side with real books from real publishers. We've also seen some examples how artificial intelligence is impacting writing itself, what we write, how we write, poetry, novels, limericks, uh, student papers. I just, on my LinkedIn account, I got an unsolicited message because I'm also a licensed teacher and have a master's in ed. And the solicitation said, we will pay you $50 to $100 an hour if you will do tutorials with artificial intelligence to teach writing. And I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting experiment. It's an interesting hourly rate. But then I thought it through a little bit more and it's like, no, I, I'm not comfortable. You know, if I teach it, whatever my writing pattern is, I've lost my voice. And I know I just got a contract for a short story and there's a new clause in it from guideposts. And the clause says, if you have used any artificial intelligence whatsoever in the construction of your story, we cannot use your article. So do you, do you think people are still going to have to know how to read? I mean, like democracy is founded on this idea that the common man, the common woman with education has a right and a responsibility to speak and be heard. What, what are you thinking 50 years out? Well, as technology marched on through the millennia, the percentage of the public that were able to read kept expanding. Mm -hmm. I think artificial intelligence will not diminish the necessity to be able to read. But having said that, in my own, I'm 81 years old. And in my own 81 plus years of, uh, of life, I was still shocked just last year to discover that there is a movement in the American education system to not teach elementary school students cursive writing anymore. Print and the keyboard, the computer keyboard, is how people are acquiring that aspect of literacy that is writing. Well, let's take reading. Already, we've seen the impact of the computer age on the attention span of readers, uh, especially <laughs> Uh, with the with the email uh, linguistic system that keeps simplifying and simplifying uh, using a, the standard letter R or O U R or A R E <laughs> and like you said all those little emojis those symbols I can create a complete sentence 
telling you how I feel about you without using one single word. Just those little images. Yeah. And I won't name them because this might be a, a family show, but there we are. But with but podcasts, still, with with podcasts. I don't necessarily need to know how to read. I can have intimate conversations from around the world in my home, listening to the visual recording of someone, you know, people like us sharing a conversation. If I can press an icon, I don't know how to, I don't need to know how to read the sentence. And with audiobooks, I can avail myself of an entire novel and not necessarily know how to read a single word. Except that every time there's been an advance in technology, more people learn how to read. I think that's still going to happen, but what they're reading, the language they are reading, that could evolve because it always has. More and more additional words, for example, were added to the English language as the impact of American slash English culture permeated the globe. First, as, as the dominant language of business, finance, and politics. And then uh, uh, today, while people of my age are bewildered by that mass little panel of images, 14-year-olds are not. 11-year-olds uh, grew up not knowing anything else. Mm. Uh, because, but also, we are in competition in terms of, of leisure time activities. First with radios, then with television sets, then with uh, desktop computers, now with iPhones. And over that trajectory of about the last 40 years, 50 years, I forget how old I am, we've seen the amount of time that, that ordinary people spend reading books whether for pleasure or for education or for just information, diminishing steadily, steadily. The, the percentage of the general population that buys books has been decreasing on a steady downslope for the last five decades. Uh, if you want more definitive information on this phenomena, uh, I would recommend that, that you visit the American Library Association website, the American Book Publishers Association website, and there are any number of academic studies and, a couple, and more than a couple of books written specifically on this phenomena. As electronic pastimes have increased, Simply reading for the fun of it has decreased. And the decreasing isn't older people reading fewer books. It's older people dying off. And the younger generations that grow up to replace us older folks <laughs> didn't have the same emotional involvement with the wonder of literature. Mm -hmm. uh, they were too busy uh, banging out TikTok videos. <laughs> yeah, well, I sit down and write poems or to write their first stories or to write down their ideas or to write a letter to a friend. They yeah, it's a different field. I was looking at some research on artificial intelligence, and I came across an article, I think it was in the Washington Post, but they said that artificial, can, artificial intelligence can now simultaneously translate 100 languages. So yeah. there is the capacity, we could argue, that the, the technology will catapult 
literacy forward in the sense that I'm not limited to just English speakers. There right. could be people in China, there could be people in Russia, that we could be having these amazing conversations and exchanges with new capabilities. So we're just sort of throwing this idea out. We, we have like a three minute wrap up. So I would love, how, how would you advise authors and writers to remain relevant? You know, regardless of what the delivery system is, what makes our words worthy of reading? And, and I love what you said, that there's got to be an, an emotional connection. Well, how would you advise to remain relevant? And we'll let the technology do what it's going to do, but we still have to provide the heart of the message. What, what I recommend is that if you want to write, read consistently, fluently, a lot. Read more than just what you would ordinarily be inclined to. Uh, try books on subjects or in genres that you're not that used to or familiar with. Broaden your literary horizon, your perspective. Number two, write every day. I don't care whether it's for 10 minutes or 10 hours. Write every day. And if you can't think of anything to sit down and write, then write to someone a letter. If all you're doing is describing your day or your feelings about what's going on in the world, write every day. And you don't have to dedicate it to a project like the great American novel. Just just get in the habit of writing. And thirdly, there will always be an audience for the written word. Remember when we had to hand make books, mm -hmm. then we got commercial printing presses. But you know, there's still a fan group out there in the world specifically targeted to handmade books, mm -hmm. making them collecting them, reading them. The, when audiobooks came around and uh, downloadable PDF files came around, it, there was uh, an anxiety that the traditional publishing industry producing hardcovers and paperback books would fall on hard times. But that didn't happen, partly because there's still enough members of our generation, <laughs> you're a little younger than I am, still around enough to make the publishing of books worthwhile. And incidentally, there are any number of how-to books available to improve your writing, to uh, break through writer's blocks, or, or, or how to get your book published or on a shoestring or even no string budget. That's that's what I'm, where the Midwest Book Review comes in. And I'll put your link in there because you've got wonderful resources for writers and authors of all backgrounds and abilities. I think as we close today, what I guess what I'm reassuring myself with, another article that I read said that artificial intelligence is running out of unique information that it can duplicate. So although it would mirror good construction, good grammar, a, a, a typical plot line, as long as we creatives are plumbing depths of new and unique works, I don't think we need to fear being replaced. The challenge is that we're not just recycling what's already done, that we continue to push limits and explore new territory. So we'll close for that today. I'll, I'll 
hit the the end of record, I'll put some links in the description and I will hang on for just a minute to chat with you later. So thank you all for listening. And Jim, you like to close us out by saying. Goodbye, good luck and good reading.